Okay, we want to thank you all for joining us today. I am Dr. Nicole Harmon, Executive Director of External Affairs for Cohen Veterans Bioscience, where I oversee our strategy and road mapping, communications and partnerships, and our Veterans Advisory Council. Next slide, please. For those unfamiliar with our organization, Cohen Veterans Bioscience is a 501c3 nonprofit biotech dedicated to fast tracking the development of diagnostics and therapeutics for brain health. Driven by our scientific roadmap, we develop and invest in tools and technologies that encourage best practices in research across brain health through platforms for data science, biomarker discovery and validation, biorepositories, imaging libraries, clinical trial networks and education and advocacy. Since our inception, our focus has been on brain trauma, specifically PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And you'll hear about some of our recent developments in this area today. But our approach has always been to rethink how we study the whole brain and how we define disorders and identify targets to see real progress for patients. We're excited to provide you regular updates and education to our vast community that's interested in brain health, including our veteran service organizations, our patient advocacy groups, families, caregivers, and our fellow researchers in brain health. Our hope is to provide education and awareness on key topics that may impact your organization and the veterans and patients that you serve. And we really welcome your feedback on interest in the area of brain health research and what you'd like to learn more about in the future. For this specific webinar, we will be providing you an introduction and overview of biomarkers. We will explain the different types of biomarkers that are currently being used to diagnose and predict brain disorders and discuss the potential of biomarkers to transform treatment for brain diseases. We will allow plenty of time for questions and we welcome your feedback. Please put them in the chat or you can send them directly to me or to the group and we will uh, answer questions at the end of the webinar. We will also be recording it and sharing it on our website in the future. We'd like to start by introducing our researchers and experts. Dr. Chantelle Furlum Beckham is our Director of Policy and Advocacy. She's a translational neuroscience by training with over 15 years experience in preclinical models of neuropsychiatric disorders and brain injury models. She's an experienced public policy and advocacy professional, having spent 10 years working on advocacy and public policy issues at the local, state, and federal level. After earning her PhD in neuroscience from Tulane, she went on to complete postdoctoral fellowships in both traumatic brain injury and clinical and preclinical models of comorbid addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder. She was later selected to be a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Institute of Health. She joined CVB in 2017, serving in a capacity that bridged her scientific and public policy backgrounds and is able to support our programmatic and policy efforts. Dr. Heather Laster is the Associate Director of Scientific Programs in the Translational Science Department of CVB. Dr. Laster has over 15 years experience in behavioral neuroscience following her PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. After earning her doctoral degree, Dr. Laster went on to complete a postdoctoral health communications fellowship at the National Cancer Institute. She subsequently transitioned the medical communications community as a senior medical writer with a focus on psychiatric and neurologic disorders. She also joined CBB in 2017. As associate director working primarily in the biomarkers portfolio, she has helmed a variety of programs aimed at advancing the discovery of development of biomarkers and diagnostic tests of PhD by promoting and guiding external collaboration and internal. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Furlan Beckham. Please remember to post your questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Nicole. Um, this webinar agenda is just to give you a little of understanding of where we're going today and what we're going to be talking about. As Nicole said, today's webinar, we want to be able to provide an overview of biomarkers to a diverse audience, many of whom may be new to this concept. So before we can discuss biomarkers in more detail, it's important to understand first what a biomarker is. A biomarker is any characteristic that can be measured as an indicator of a normal biological process, a disease process, 
or a biological response to a treatment or intervention. To put this a little bit more simply, a biomarker is anything that can be accurately measured to indicate the state of health of a living organism. We've used biomarkers in medicine for a long time. For instance, every time you go to the doctor, even for routine health checkups, your doctor may perform a variety of tests, such as taking your blood pressure, drawing blood to check levels of various molecules, and measuring your heart rate. Your doctor may even perform more complex tests, such as genetic tests and MRI scans. All of these different tests provide your doctor with clues about your body's overall health. Your doctor is using biomarkers to check your current health and help screen you for several common medical conditions. The use of biomarkers in the diagnosis and management of conditions such as cardiovascular diseases, infections, genetic disorders, and cancer is well known. The discovery of biomarkers for these conditions arose from a need to be able to measure various biological processes of our body objectively without having to rely on more subjective based diagnostic strategies, such as a patient's symptoms. This doesn't mean that your doctor does not listen to your symptoms for clues about what is going on with you. In contrast, your doctor will not only listen to your symptoms, but also factor in your biological information through the use of a single biomarker, or more often, a group of biomarkers called a biological signature to better diagnose you and manage your condition. Biomarkers can be used across all stages of health and disease, from long before you ever suspect you have a disease to the stage of diagnosis and throughout the treatment process and beyond. The types of biomarkers used in today's health and medicine generally fall into six categories based on their specific use. Let's take a minute to walk a little more about through these six different categories of biomarkers and see how they can be used to inform clinical care. The first category of of biomarker is a risk biomarker. A risk biomarker is any biomarker that can be used to indicate the potential for developing a disease or medical condition and someone who does not currently have that disease or medical condition. One of the most well-known examples of a risk biomarker is the BRCA1 gene. Most individuals have a lifetime risk of approximately 13% for developing breast cancer. However, in those who test positive for the BRCA1 gene, they have a risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime of 50 to 80 percent. Diagnostic biomarkers are used to detect or confirm the presence of a disease or medical condition or to identify individuals with a subtype of a disease. Blood sugar to diagnose type 2 diabetes is a good example of a diagnostic biomarker. A response biomarker is used to show that a biological response to a treatment or exposure has occurred in an individual. For example, is a patient undergoing chemotherapy showing improvement in the size of their cancer tumor? This would be a response biomarker. A monitoring biomarker is used to detect the status of a disease or medical condition over time and determine whether the patient's condition severity has increased or decreased. In patients with pros prostate cancer, Prostate-specific antigen is routinely assessed to check cancer progression during treatment. A predictive biomarker is used to indicate individuals who more likely than those without the biomarker to experience a favorable or unfavorable outcome from a treatment or exposure. In addition to being a risk biomarker, the BRCA1 gene can also serve as a predictive biomarker in women with platinum-sensitive ovarian cancer to identify patients likely to respond to a particular type of treatment. Finally, a prognostic biomarker can indicate the likelihood of a clinical event, disease recurrence, or progression in patients with a disease or medical condition. One example of a prognostic biomarker is the Gleason score, which is used to evaluate the likelihood of cancer progression in patients with prostate cancer. As you can see from these examples, although some biomarkers can serve multiple functions, there is often a need to find multiple biomarkers or a biological signature for a single disease that serves different purposes. For example, some neurological diseases have sufficient diagnostic tests but lack prognostic biomarkers that can indicate disease progression, predictive biomarkers that can help determine the right therapy for an individual, or response biomarkers to measure the efficacy of a treatment. So what does a good biomarker look like? 
For biomarkers to be useful in human health and disease, they must have several characteristics. First, biomarkers must have the appropriate sensitivity and specificity such that cases can be distinguished from healthy individuals and one disease can be distinguished from another. Because biomarkers need to be consistently used from one lab to another and between patients of very different backgrounds, a good biomarker needs to be both reliable and reproducible. Additionally, biomarkers need to be able, be able to be used in a wide variety of clinical settings and administered by individuals with a range of medical knowledge from the battlefield to the operating room. Therefore, an ideal biomarker should be simple to perform and ideally non-invasive or minimally invasive. Finally, a good biomarker should be inexpensive to ensure that it can be used widely across clinical settings. For many diseases of the body, assessing biomarkers is fairly straightforward as the underlying biology of the disease is well understood and the biological materials critical for the discovery and validation of useful biomarkers can be more easily assessed. However, the discovery and validation of biomarkers for diseases of the brain presents several inherent challenges that have delayed breakthroughs compared to other disease areas. This is especially true for psychiatric conditions such as PTSD and depression, which are particularly impactful for society and present numerous difficulties in their diagnosis and treatment largely because the underlying biology of the disease remains a mystery. Perhaps the most challenging, pro prominent challenge to biomarker discovery in neurological diseases is the location of these diseases in the brain. It is not easy to take a sample of tissue from the brain and even imaging techniques such as MRI and PET scans are limited in their use for discovery as they are not widely available and very expensive. Further, up until recently, simple point-of-care blood and urine tests, which represent the vast majority of biological material sources for biomarker discovery and other diseases, were less informative for neurological diseases. This is because few proteins are purely specific to the brain, meaning that their presence could indicate other complications in the body or make it impossible to distinguish one disorder from another. For those proteins that are, very, are specific to the brain, their concentration in the blood or cerebral spinal fluid are often extremely low, requiring detection assays or specialized tools for measurement that are very sensitive to these low levels. Another challenge is that many brain disorders do not have animal models that are clinically relevant and can be used for scientific discoveries in animals that will then be translated to humans. Finally, one of the biggest challenges to biomarker discovery for neurological diseases is the validation of biomarkers. The process of validating biomarkers can include such hurdles as ensuring that patient samples are collected, handled, and characterized with the same best practices and quality standards, that the different commercially available platforms for measuring the biomarker are reproducible and comparable across patients and across laboratories, or that the assay accurately measures the biomarker it is intended to measure. Despite these challenges, biomarker discovery for brain disorders is urgently needed to aid in the prediction, diagnosis, and management of these debilitating diseases. One such brain disorder in which biomarkers is urgently needed is PTSD. PTSD is a complex neuropsychiatric disease that currently has no objective diagnostic tests, no known cure, few treatment options, and no treatment option that is fully effective in all patients. Currently, PTSD is diagnosed using a symptom-based approach. That means that in order for the condition to be diagnosed, someone who believes that they are suffering from PTSD must go to a clinician usually a medical doctor who specializes in psychiatric diseases, who will then compare their symptoms with a checklist and decide whether that patient does or does not meet the diagnostic criteria for PTSD. One problem with this approach is that it assumes that PTSD has a uniform presentation in all patients. In fact, a patient can have one of over 600,000 combinations of symptoms for a clinician to diagnose them with PTSD. This suggests that PTSD, similar to other disorders like depression, is heterogeneous, meaning that symptoms across patients can be vastly different. Biomarkers offer the opportunity to identify 
the different PTSD subtypes, allowing clinicians to group patients based on their unique combination of bio biomarkers or their biomarker signature. In PTSD, many biomarkers have already been suggested as candidates for further evaluation, but few have been, have been validated and none have been implemented into clinical care. We are hoping to change that with our work to identify biological signatures for PTSD subtypes that can help guide rapid diagnosis and treatment for a precision medicine approach to PTSD care. Cohen Veterans Bioscience is taking a unique approach to biomarker development and validation. Our focus goes beyond the next big media story or research publication, which often highlight a breakthrough biomarker for disease X or disease Y. Instead, we are taking a systematic approach to biomarker discovery and validation that focuses on some of the more difficult pain points that often lead to the failure of a biomarker to be integrated into clinical care. Typically, early evidence of a biomarker is reported as a punitive care candidate for a disease of interest, such as PTSD. Often, this is based on a case control study in which biomarker X was shown to be higher in those with PTSD versus controls. CVB's Rapid DX program then brings together large, well characterized cohort studies of PTSD and uses big data and computational approaches to harmonize the existing data and accelerate discovery and validation on a much larger scale. In addition, because accurate and reliable, reliable and sensitive assays for the detection of biomarkers are a significant pain point during the validation process, we conduct cross class platform comparisons to ensure that the way we are measuring biomarkers is transformative for faster and more reliable biomarker discovery. Finally, we are also supporting large-scale biomarker analyses of bio biological samples from patients with PTSD that leverage our efforts in data science and platform evaluation to provide definitive validation of new biomarkers in order to speed their use in clinical medicine. All of these efforts are aimed at bringing solution to, to today's medical health challenges on an accelerated time scale. Now I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Heather Lassiter, who will go into more detail about two of our efforts as part of the Rapid DX program. She will first discuss our cross-platform comparison study for biomarkers of the immune system. The immune system has shown promise as underlying many of the symptoms of patients with PTSD and other brain disorders. As we previously mentioned, many of the biomarkers that we are interested in are very difficult to measure because their concentration in the blood is very low. The goal of this comparison study was to evaluate commercially available assays from different manufacturers to determine which assays show low sensitivity, moderate sensitivity, or high sensitivity for measuring biomarkers of the immune system. The results of this study are critical to ensuring that we are choosing the right test for the right molecule in the blood to develop, valid, develop and validate accurate and reliable biomarkers. Heather will also discuss our BEST study, which was conducted in partnership with Stanford University. This critical study aimed at determining a response biomarker for PTSD using electroencephalogram or EEG, which is a test that detects changes in the electrical activity of your brain using small metal discs that are attached to your scalp. Heather will show how the results of this study may be able to be used to predict treatment responses in patients with different subtypes of PTSD. Thank you for that introduction, Chantel. Um, just bringing up my screen. So as I'll discuss in a moment, there's a great need for standardization and biomarker measurement, given the amount of variability that could be introduced by using different tools. Well, CVB's ultimate goal is to develop biomarkers of PTSD, it may not even be clear what are the best tools for assessing these. Hence, one of our goals is to change the ecosystem by establishing best practices for measuring biomarkers. This will not only enable our own biomarker discovery efforts, but also help researchers in the field identify the right tools for the job to ensure that there can be standardization across biomarker measurements in different studies.
because structured comparisons of available tools is a time-consuming and resource-intensive process, one of CDB's goals is to hold a series of bake-offs or cross-platform comparisons to identify the best technologies for assessing blood-based biomarkers. So there are a variety of areas where CDB could target its bake-off efforts in terms of different omics modalities as laid out on the slide, each of which is important for uncovering distinct aspects of PTSD biology. For our first bake-off, we chose to evaluate platforms for measuring inflammatory signatures, focusing on cytokines. Given robust literature implicating pro-inflammatory cytokines in PTSD and the ability to detect these proteins in blood samples. As brief overview, trauma and stress may initiate inflammatory processes in the brain that provoke a variety of signaling cascades and the release of stress hormones that results in systemic inflammation, including the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. In addition, evidence does indicate that systemic inflammation contributes to PTSD symptomatology and likely underpins the enhanced risk for chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases or metabolic diseases, as well as adverse health outcomes that are seen in the PTSD population. So looking at a variety of reviews and meta-analyses um, across PTSD, suicide, trauma exposure, and depression is shown on this slide and looking at a variety of uh, inflammatory markers shown on the left hand of this figure. There appear to be a number of biomarkers that are elevated across psychiatric conditions. For instance, C-reactive protein shown by the yellow bar appears to be elevated across these four different psychiatric conditions. However, there are some biomarkers that are likely distinct to each category. For instance, in the case of PTSD, there's a panel of biomarkers, including IL-1 beta, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and INF-gamma, that appear to be elevated in PTSD and also differentiated from other conditions such as depression. One reason for determining the right platform and technology for evaluating inflammatory biomarkers is that there are discordant findings around biomarkers in the field. So this slide is showing some of the top biomarkers that have been studied in the context of PTSD with a number of studies on the y-axis and the name of biomarker on the x-axis. However, even when assessing biomarkers that are most heavily implicated in PTSD, there are conflicting findings as to whether a specific biomarker was increased as shown in the green bars or decreased as shown in the red bars in PTSD patients as compared to control, control subjects. This is also true for inflammatory markers. For instance, in the case of IL-6, there are approximately an equal number of studies that report IL-6 was higher in PTSD patients, as reported that there is no difference between PTSD patients and controls. So as Chantel mentioned, um, one challenge contributing to variability in reported findings is that inflammatory markers are typically at very low concentrations in human blood and require highly sensitive assays to be detected. Cytokines, such as IL-6 and TNF-alpha, typically are at more moderate levels. However, others like IL-1 beta and IF gamma are typically at much lower levels and require highly sensitive technologies in order to be detected. So while this data is not shown on this slide, studies have shown that the type of assay that is used can greatly contribute to variability across studies. Here we're looking at a meta-analysis of research in psychosis um, that is showing that there are 17 different vendors used across 30 studies However, um, the specific assay was not even considered when um, this meta-analysis was assessing the sources of variability, which really highlights the importance that awareness needs to be raised in the field that the choice of assay matters and does bear careful consideration. So as it noted, we conducted this inflammation bake-off with the goal to conduct a head-to-head -head comparison across five commercially available inflammation profiling platforms in samples that were obtained from PTSD Parkinson's disease, and healthy controls. I should note that this is a collaboration between Cohen Veterans Bioscience and the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. Our goal is to utilize both clinical and technical samples to first, in the clinical samples, understand the likely measurements in plasma and serum from our healthy controls and in the clinical populations. And then we utilized technical samples to really look at assay performance across a number of different parameters, um, ones considered on the next slide will be precision, sensitivity, and parallelism.
So just to provide an overview or a snapshot of our findings, this is our inflammation bake off scorecard where platform performance is ranked across the three different analytical parameters with the performance metrics defined in the right hand boxes. So general green is indicative of good performance, orange intermediate, and red is a poorer performance. While there are some platforms such as Quanterix that had good performance across all of the four biomarkers in this initial analysis. There are others like Myriad that failed to detect these four biomarkers in any of the blood samples. But I will draw your attention to, for the other companies on the slide, there was variable performance across the four different cytokines, which may indicate that if a researcher knows the cytokine that they are going to measure or aim to measure, this could be a consideration when choosing their source of platform and assay. So we always want to take it back to, so what and who cares? So my hope is that in terms of who cares, um, this would be researchers everywhere. While these findings are, again, specific to PTSD and um, PD in this specific study, um, really the findings are relevant across disease states and anywhere where you might uh, suspect that there is an increase in inflammation that contributes to the disease. Moreover, these findings do provide novel evidence that the immunoassay choice impacts um, findings. It shows that there's high variability in performance between platforms and across immunoassays. It also may provide information around what assays should be selected for future research studies. And I also want to emphasize that while this um, comparative evaluation was published in 2020, um, it's important to continue conducting these evaluations as technologies do continue to evolve. And then lastly, we do hope that these findings will directly impact and inform CBB's own biomarker discovery efforts. So much like CBB committed to establishing best practices for valuing biomarkers, we're also committed to partnering with researchers in the field who are advancing our ability to use biomarkers to inform treatment of brain disease and ultimately support future precision medicine approaches. So today, I'd like to highlight work done by Amit Atkin at Stanford University, whose lab is aiming to identify and develop neuroimaging markers to support the treatment selection for PTSD patients, with the end goal of developing tools that can be more readily implemented in the clinic. So for this webinar, I'll go through a high-level summary of this research and provide an overview of the biomarker establishment superior treatment of PTSD, or the BEST study, which wrapped up patient recruitment in 2019. So the challenge that BEST is aiming to address is that there is a lack of clinic-ready tools for predicting whether a PTSD patient will improve over the course of treatment. So while psychotherapies are the most evidence-based treatments for PTSD, not all individuals with PTSD have access to psychotherapy, and psychotherapy is not effective in all patients. So for this, CDB teamed up with Stanford University to study clinical biomarkers and neural signatures in PTSD to help match patients with the most effective treatment, with goals being to further establish objective ways to identify biological biomarkers of PTSD to inform targeted treatment selection, and also help predict responses to treatment Enable, to enable support of biomarkers as companion diagnostics in the clinic. So Meet Edkin's previous work, which we'll cover momentarily, has demonstrated that a combination biomarker consisting of a neuroimaging assessment plus performance on a verbal memory task predicted whether or not a person with PTSD would respond to a type of psychotherapy called prolonged exposure therapy. So for this study, published in Science Translational Medicine, two separate cohorts of PTSD patients were assessed. These included, um, in study one, a set of civilian population that was mainly female, primarily unmedicated, and who were diagnosed with PTSD based on the dsm 4 Study two consisted of veterans that was primarily male, medicated, and who were diagnosed based on the dsm 5 Groups then underwent resting state functional MRI scans, as described on this slide, to assess functional connectivity between seven different networks or sets of brain regions that interact together. And they were also evaluated for poor performance on a verbal memory test, which consisted of learning a list of words. Of interest, the PTSD group could be divided into patients who were impaired on the verbal memory test or those who were intact on the verbal memory test shown here in the black and the gray bars. Researchers found that 
PTS patients who were impaired on the verbal memory task also had lower connectivity in a certain brain network relative to both healthy controls as well as to the intact um, PTSD group. However, there are no differences between the healthy controls and the so-called intact PTSD. Despite study two having different patient demographics, these findings were again demonstrated in this group where a set of PTSD patients, again, who were impaired on the verbal memory task also exhibited lower neural activity patterns. For both groups, these impairments were not associated with differences in PTSD severity, comorbidities, and were not associated with age, intelligence, or performance on other cognitive tasks. Not only did this work identify a biobehavioral type of PTSD that consisted of impaired verbal memory and lower connectivity, but this combo biomarker also predicted response to prolonged exposure treatment. To evaluate this, PTSD subjects from cohort one were randomized to either a prolonged exposure therapy group or to a wait list as a non-therapy control group. PTSD severity was measured using the CAPS-4 and it was assessed at the pre and at the post treatment time point, as well as before and after the waiting period. So as you might expect, individuals who are not assigned to treatment and who are simply on the wait list showed little change in PTSD severity over time. However, PTSD subjects had different responses to prolonged exposure therapy based on their underlying characteristics. So for this, PTSD patients who had both low within network connectivity and impaired verbal memory did not respond to psychotherapy. However, individuals who were either um, impaired in terms of their verbal memory or had low connectivity did respond to um, psychotherapy indicating that a certain phenotype may be a powerful predictor of treatment outcome. So overall, these findings do support the idea that there is biological heterogeneity in the PTSD population and that biological differences can impact how a patient responds to treatment. Based on this, we may be able to use this combination biomarker to stratify patients into psychotherapy responsive or psychotherapy non-responsive subgroups and then use these markers to understand what treatments may be best suited for a particular patient subgroup. So instead of waiting to see whether a patient benefits from a long course of treatment, which may be up to eight weeks or more, um, this biomarker would enable clinicians to determine upfront whether a different or a more assertive treatment strategy may benefit a certain patient. So MEETS Labs extending on these findings in the BEST program by replicating these in a larger PTSD population that's being recruited from local VA centers. And then they are additionally assessing whether this treatment response biomarker could predict outcomes with cognitive processing therapy, a different type of psychotherapy. And they're also assessing whether a more clinic-friendly form of brain imaging, such as EEG, could replace fMRI and also successfully predict outcomes with both prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy. Via collaboration with Cohen Veterans Bioscience, we also added a biospecimen biomarker component to this study where blood and saliva were collected at both the pre and the post treatment time points to determine whether or not there may also be a biological blood-based marker that can predict treatment response. So ultimately, our goal is to identify brain and behavioral tests that predict treatment outcomes and can be used as decision support tools in the clinic. So in terms of the future of biomarker-driven treatment for brain diseases, our goal is to really develop less invasive, invasive testing to support earlier diagnosis of PTSD, to accelerate um, the speed of drug development, and also develop more effective and personalized treatments for those suffering from PTSD. We begin down this path first by conducting our omics bake-off with a to enable the identification of diagnostic markers by identifying the best platforms for conducting biomarker discovery research. Through our collaboration with BEST, we are identifying a treatment response biomarker to help match PTSD patients with the best treatment and also perhaps leverage biospecimens from the study to identify a blood-based treatment response biomarker. And as can be a topic for future webinars, we're also engaged in efforts with the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, their PTSD working group, 
who have recently published findings that have identified genetic markers that are associated with the risk of developing PTSD. So we are well poised um, to continue such research down the road. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Nicole, who will be managing our Q&A. And also note that in, dis in addition to myself and Chantal, we also have our CSO, Andreas Stroman, and Magali Haas on the line who are also available to help with a question and answer period if uh, specific questions do come up. So Nicole, thank you to you. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Chantel, previously, and a uh, great uh, overview. I'm going to read a couple of questions that have been submitted in the chat, um, and I welcome you to also, um, in, a, in a minute, you can take yourself on mute and ask questions yourselves. Um, first question, besides plasma, do you include other samples for analyses, and which analytes seem most relevant for biomarker identification? So I can take that question, sure. Um, Great. So this is a key question that we consider. Um, for example, we included um, multiple types of biospecimen in our assay comparisons, for instance, within the context of the Bake Off. So we're looking at serum and uh, plasma to understand whether different blood fractions may have different um, cytokines that are being measured. Um, these samples are ideal for measuring proteins and metabolites, for instance, in the periphery. Also, in some of our ongoing studies, we do have a biospecimen component around saliva with the idea that saliva can be used for genetics or could be used for assessing hormones like cortisol. Um, and then we're also engaging in some other efforts that are utilizing human brain tissue for mapping out key modalities of interest. Um, I do want to note that in terms of access to human brain tissue or to CSF, this is a bit more complicated. Um, so for instance, um, obtaining brain samples in PTSD can be complex as we found because postmortem samples often will be confounded uh, by having comorbid neurodegeneration, excuse me, neurodegeneration or other terminal clinical states. Um, but we do hope to perhaps engage in these efforts down the road. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Heather. Second question. Why did you choose to look at cognitive therapies for the best study? And can you do the same thing with pharmaceutical drugs? So in terms of using cognitive behavioral therapies for the best study, these are some of the most effective therapies uh, for PTSD. Um, we could potentially, or they could potentially do the same things using pharmaceutical drugs. I know that Amit's lab has published similar findings around a neuroimaging marker and also predicting responses to antidepressants, uh, specifically sertraline. So presumably you could use a similar stratification approach based on brain networks and other biological systems to evaluate uh, pharmaceutical drugs and PTSD. I would say one challenge in this space is that in contrast to depression, um, PTSD only has two um, drugs that have been approved by the FDA uh, for the treatment of PTSD. So there's um, some limitations there, um, but in the future, similar strategies could be applied to personalized treatment uh, plans across Across these types. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Heather. Okay, next question. Um, can you comment on recent data that is suggesting the non-reliability of fMRI? Andreas, let me turn that over to you. Sorry, I was muted. I don't know. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, very good. So again, thank you for that question. This is one of the reasons why we have or are in the process of revalidating this biomarker based on uh, EEG rather than fMRI because to the point here, some of these imaging modalities, fMRI, I would say task included, is typically not robust enough in the multi-site setting. Um, compared to other measures and in terms of like uh, uh, to measure the connectome, EEG being one of them as well. So the point is well taken and again, is I think it's a useful research tool, but certainly not robust enough for a clinical setting. Uh, hence the translation and the validation as an EEG best measure. And I think the good news is that we see similar signals based on EEG uh, previously discovered and validated based on fMRI. So stay tuned is, is one answer here. 
I don't think it's necessarily I mean, restricted to fMRI only, has some applicability to other imaging technologies as well. There was a recent paper in Nature who looked at this um, in terms of a, a challenge basically to look at the same imaging with different analysis pipelines and different acquisition parameters as well. Um, so I think it's also an area in the imaging field in general, and Megali can comment this as well, where standardization uh, is, is truly needed as well. Uh, we know that there are efforts underway. Uh, there are also efforts needed in order to standardize really a phantom uh, for these imaging measures. And that's another effort which is currently uh, being pursued by Cohen Veterans Biosciences. Thanks, uh, Andres. Um, I can further comment that on the topic of MRI assessment, especially uh, using advanced MRI uh, imaging approaches like uh, cartography, uh, resting state fMRI, that the field has been challenged by um, the ability to conduct multi-center clinical trials where there's standardization of the data across uh, multiple centers. And in order to address that challenge, we initiated a process of designing a off if you know, similar concept um, of, of phantoms uh, that can be used to help standardize uh, machines across uh, study centers. Phantoms are either in vivo individuals that go from one site to another, and um, because they have the same brain going from one side to the other, you can measure uh, uh, MRI parameters and, and see what the differences are uh, in measurement from one individual at one site to another site. Or we have in vitro phantoms, which are physical devices um, that can measure features or specific parameters of an fMRI, and those can be measured um, within a given site and across sites, and the difference in accuracy of measurement can be assessed. However, uh, each phantom in the in vitro setting can only measure specific parameters, and we have a variety of phantoms. MRI measures we'd like to be able to assess and, and translate to the clinical uh, readouts. So uh, this is a, a turning to very uh, large study um, looking at different uh, uh, multiple phantoms and comparing their performance against each other and against um, the in vivo phantom to see how they each perform relative to each other. Um, when we are also conducting a national normative neuroimaging study in partnership with three universities, uh, University of Virginia, Baylor, and, Univ and Utah, um, to establish reference standards for what normal neuroimaging looks like. Um, and we, again, use phantoms across these different centers to establish standardization um, before we start collecting the data. So stay tuned for more information forthcoming there. Thank you, Magali. Okay, next question. How would this be imagined to change clinical decision making? Would we withhold psychotherapy or change the order of medication or functional therapies based on these biomarkers? Yeah, I can take it or Heather maybe can answer this as well. Heather, maybe you want to take a stab at this or I don't know, I see you're muted. I didn't realize I was muted, so I would say I can take a stab and then pass it off as necessary. Um, in terms of changing the clinical decision making, I don't think we have clear answers on how specifically to change the clinical decision making. Um, certainly can form, uh, perhaps the patient could be on uh, drugs in addition to psychotherapy, perhaps on a more aggressive um, course of psychotherapy, but certainly this would be something that a clinician could consider up front and um, this would contextualize um, evaluating how a patient is responding over time. I think I can maybe to reiterate the fact here, and I think Heather discussed it previously, I mean, we're looking at this from a platform technology perspective in the context of precision medicine. I mean, the goal really is to tailor the right treatment to the right patient. So, I mean, I understand currently there's limited choices. So this withholding information, I think, is, is something which really needs to be discussed and understood in more detail. To me, I would say, and there's a number of editorials who've addressed this, there's also the timing issue. 
and the trajectory for a given patient, what's the likelihood of responsiveness, what's the accessibility within the different pillars of care now, this being the Veterans Administration, primary care and others as well. So, I mean, the goal really is to, this is just a starting point to really build out a precision medicine platform here for the right treatment for the right patient and understanding trauma related disorders really at the molecular level particular as it retains, uh, pertains to PTSD. And if I could add on to that, um, I think in order to inform clinical decision making, uh, more work needs to be done on these platforms to establish how predictive are they um, in an individual case that they will respond or not respond to a given therapy. Um, it, the platform would need to be tested across different uh, treatment modalities, as was already mentioned earlier, not just looking at psychotherapy, but what form of psychotherapy is it um, giving a response indicator to, um, as well as uh, medications. Um, you need to look at different classes of medications as well and, and determine whether the biomarker is equally predictive across different medications. Um, and possibly also looking at uh, resting state trans, um, repetitive transmagnetic stimulation, RTMS, uh, as an, another alternative therapy that we, um, we started to look at. So more work needs to be done to understand how well um, this marker predicts response and or non-response um, to treatment. And having that information in hand um, and knowing that um, it is highly predictive um, in one case or the other, what a clinician could do is then determine whether uh, whether they do select psychotherapy as a first choice or whether they look at alternative uh, therapeutic approaches as a first choice. If you thought your patient was not going to respond to multiple weeks of treatment, why would you put them through that treatment, especially when uh, certain forms of treatment can be challenging for the individuals? That Those are some of the reasons why we're, uh, we need to take a very... Uh, broad approach in, and a platform approach in the evaluation of these biomarkers. Great. Okay, next question. How do we rapidly evaluate multiple biomarkers and multiple treatments to map patients from where they are to what treatments might be best for them? Um, I'd like to take that one. Um, I think um, one of the ways that we could uh, do this is actually by taking a, a very different approach um, to the one that has been traditionally taken. Um, instead of doing uh, one population at a time or one treatment at a time or one biomarker at a time, uh, what we could do is uh, adopt a new uh, design clinical design approaches, um, including things like adaptive platform trial designs, basket, des basket designs, and other um, design models, where you would, you would um, bring in patients uh, with either uh, all having the same uh, underlying diagnoses or perhaps a, a, a range of diagnoses, um, and then deeply profiling them with uh, these biomarker, different biomarker modalities at the same time at baseline. So you would be assessing them across EEG, uh, imaging, if it's standardized, uh, blood-based measures, any for a variety of these measures simultaneously. And then you would um, treat them with a variety of different mechanisms of, of therapeutic intervention that you had a belief that you, you had an established reason to believe would have an impact on the underlying condition. Um, and after uh, a suitable period of time uh, where you would see a treatment effect, you would then measure again all of those biomarkers. So what you're accomplishing by doing this sort of parallel approach is you're looking, um, you're not assuming that you know who's going to respond to which treatment um, at any given time, and you're allowing the treatment to act as um, a way of, of testing the system and uh, changing the system, or what I call a perturbogen. Um, and then the biomarker readouts um, before and after tell us uh, who's responded, who's not responded, and which biomarkers are actually sensitive to response. It also tells us a little bit about what's different from one mechanism to another uh, as we look at the data across uh, different parallel arms. So um, 
So this type of adaptive platform trial approach is what we had um, developed as an idea and, and brought to the Department of Defense um, and were funded to develop a clinical trial design for, um, which the DOD is uh, taking forward now into a clinical program. And hopefully we will start to see the type of data that emerges uh, from that type of parallel effort. Thank you. Next question was, why EEG and not MEG? Yeah, I can take it. It's again technical in nature. It's a more uh, widely, at least at the present time, readily deployable technology. Uh, in my understanding, at least, and we can argue this compared to MEG, where the instrumentation typically is more involved than sitting out a 24, 48 electro uh, electrode cap, dry or wet or semi-wet, semi-dry on someone's head and reading out the signal by a non-skilled professional, um, like potentially uh, in, a, in a very rapid and affordable manner. So that was the consideration here. There are data for PTSD, chronic TBI, who have looked at these connectome changes based on MAG as well. Uh, similar uh, signals being reported typically in smaller scale studies, which have not been brought forward in a validation study. So again, I think it's good as a discovery tool, but not really as an applied tool, which can be very widely deployed in a number of different care settings as well. That was the rationale here. Thank you, Andreas. Do you have plans to stratify biomarkers by current treatment, psychotherapy or pharm pharmacotherapy, and differentiate biomarkers based on whether patients are responsive or resistant to treatment? We don't currently have any active clinical trials underway, um, apart from the study that we helped to design with the Department of Defense in which they're taking forward. Um, and that study will in fact um, lead to this type of stratification biomarker approach and understanding of different um, treatments, therapeutics, at least uh, pharmacotherapies and how they respond. Um, and in time, we may on, undertake to take uh, other studies as well, uh, looking at, uh, at psychotherapy and, and other modalities. Maybe can I add to this? I mean, obviously, an understanding of what underlies biological PTSD or PTS and trauma-related disorders, there's obviously advances made in TBI, and certain people on this webinar can to speak now and are involved in these efforts as well, will lead to the development of very tailored and new treatments as well. So uh, I think there's multiple parallel efforts underway um, in order to really help develop this concept of precision medicine with this platform technologies we described here. Yes, absolutely. I think we have to be very clear. We're not talking about the field at large. Um, we're speaking about what CVB has been specifically involved with, um, but you're, you're absolutely right. The field at large is doing quite a number of things here and, um, and a lot of efforts are underway. Okay, next question. Systemic biomarkers reflect a variety of diseases. Why, why not look at specific brain biomarkers? Yeah, so it's not, it's not forgotten forgotten in quotation mark, it in fact is on the list. I think it brings up a couple of uh, interesting opportunities. I mean, one is obviously the TBI field, both acute or acute and chronically have discovered and validated certain biomarkers as well. And these are prime candidates to be explored in PTSD and these more chronic forms of trauma related disorders as well. There is an emerging body of literature as well, which we're happy to share with the attendees as well, this is one. So this provides certainly an opportunity to look at more neurodegenerative or brain related changes in particular in PTSD, PTS or chronic TBI, that's one. I would also say the re one of the reasons why we looked at the systemic inflammatory biomarkers because it's I don't think the field is decided on whether PTSD or PTS necessarily is a brain specific disorder, but overall, at least a, a component of PTS or PTSD constitutes a what's described in some of the reviews at metabolic crisis. So. 
looking at inflammatory markers may actually provide an opportunity to look at not just brain, but more organ related changes as they pertain to a chronic uh, stress response as well. So there's complementarity in the approaches, but absolutely the proteins we've seen, brain specific proteins, brain enriched proteins, brain neurofilament light chain, uh, GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein, and others, they will be explored and have been explored in this population as well. It will be discovered in quotation mark and validated as well. And the idea or the, the thinking certainly is there is a combination of biomarkers depending on what the clinical utility would be, potentially a combination of utility depending where these technologies would be deployed. So um, that certainly is, is the thinking here as well. It's, it's multidimensional, it's systems biology. Thank you, Andreas. We are gonna wrap at this time um, to, to uh, be cognizant of everyone's time. I know there are other questions that were submitted that have not been answered, um, and we will try to do so uh, by email. If you also have additional questions, we want to always welcome info at cohenbio.org uh, is our uh, way of uh, communicating the easiest with the organization. We want to thank all of you for joining us today and for bringing these important questions and your interest. Uh, we appreciate your thoughts and insights. We want to thank Chantel and Heather for their great work in presenting this material and continue to follow us on the, our social media channels where we post about our latest research, um, our team's research, our partner's research. Uh, be sure to visit the website and sign up for our newsletter um, that will also alert you to future webinars. And we will be sending a survey where you can fill out information about what you'd like to hear in future webinar series. And we hope that you will complete that information and, uh, so we can ensure that we're providing news that you can use. Um, so thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon.